We've got Shane here in the MC role, and I'm joined by some of these lovely friends from NASA. We'll go through introductions here shortly, but looks like people are pouring in. Wow, that's pretty fast. While people are jumping in there, I thought I would share that uh, a couple a couple of tips on how to interact with the Zoom Zoom window. So for those that have never been on a Zoom webinar before, uh, I'll get the, the chat open to all of you to sort of get, what am I trying to say, get communicating with each other. Let's see here. There you go. And then for any questions you have for uh, the NASA team or myself during this challenge, actually don't put them into the chat window, but there's a little button down there that says Q&A. Uh, if you put it there, it'll actually help us keep our place in, in this discussion so that um, we can come back to your questions later. Um, and so yeah, please use that Q&A form at any point to ask us questions that you'd like answered. Um, but if you'd like to chat with each other, you're welcome to do so uh, in the chat panel. Why don't we start while I'm getting introductions here. Um, if people in chat want to share where they're, they're listening from um, or what group they're affiliated with, what their team is, feel free to throw that in there. Uh, I'm coming at you from Northern Illinois today. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest of the NASA team here, but um, why don't I get to start with introductions anyway? So my name is Shane. You might have seen me on some past Hero X ones. Um, I'm just going to serve as our moderator for today's discussion. And I've been working with Hero X for a couple of years now, and it's been a real pleasure to see um, the, the magical things that you, the crowd, can do for these challenges. You've really helped move the needle on some tough projects. So with that, I'll pass it to Andy here, uh, who's joining us from NASA. Hi, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, late, early morning. Uh, my name is Andy Provenza. I'm a, currently the Deputy Project Manager of Technology for University Innovation, and that's inside of aeronautics. So, um, we don't work on space things. We work on things that uh, breathe air and, and, and run in the air, so in the atmosphere. Um, yeah, I um, <clears throat> came to Hero X to uh, run this challenge and provided some of the initial content, and um, they've since taken it and taken it and created this challenge for you. So thank you. I'm looking forward to giving you some information on zero emissions aviation and some of the things that we're currently looking for and, and working on. So stay tuned. Awesome, thanks Andy. And Kevin, how about you? Yeah, just real quick, Andy Andy is the challenge owner, but I'm supporting the challenge and I, I'm out of uh, Langley Research Center, which is the first NASA center and traditionally an aeronautic center. So this is a, a very important challenge to us too. And I, I'm working in the Game Changing Technology Development Project Office as well as Prizes and Challenges Program. And so this is, this is a, a, a very interesting challenge. It has a lot of aspects that uh, are, are very important to NASA as well as everybody in the world if we can uh, make make aircraft flight more efficient and, and less less pollutants so good to be here wonderful thank you guys well with that um i'll just share one last thing but then we'll jump into a little presentation from our nasa folks um i wanted to point out that if you're on the challenge page for this project and we'll come back here to do a full walkthrough shortly you might notice that Immediately in this overview section here is some information about eligibility. Um, this challenge does mirror similar NASA challenges and being open to only people 18 or older. Um, however, you must you should note that this challenge requires that team captains be a U.S. citizen, legal permanent permanent resident, or asylum grantee. In essence, um, if you come from another country that's still eligible uh, normally in terms of designated countries. Um, you will still have to find a team captain that is from the U.S. for this challenge. So um, if you're wondering how to do that, there are some great ways once you've joined the challenge, I'll show you later, to click find a team or find a team member, or you can come to the forum here to ask for help with that. Um, but yeah, I, we encourage you to work on collaborating with, with your fellow competitors and forming a team that's eligible to participate in this challenge so you're able to do so. But with that, I'll stop my share and hand it over to Andy to tell us a bit about what this challenge is for. Go on ahead. Great, thanks, Shane. Oh, I'm on the last slide. Let me go back, stop sharing, and go to PowerPoint. Sorry about this.
Well, let me start. Let me just do this. Okay. Well, Shane, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. You might have to go back to that green share screen button. Let me go back to that. No worries. Zoom. Okay. Zoom. And share screen. We practice this ahead of time, I promise. Okay, there here we, we go. go. Okay. All right. So uh, Kevin mentioned he was from Langley. I'm from the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we're at Turbo Machinery Ex Center of Excellence. And uh, a lot of folks there work in aeronautics. And a number of folks are working on how to clean up the skies, how to... Um, make a plane travel farther on a tank of gas, make it quieter and produce less emissions, especially harmful ones. So I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about our university innovation project quickly, uh, and then get into the guts of, uh, of this particular challenge. So you can see um, uh, the United States there, there's over a hundred universities that we're currently working with inside of university innovation uh, in our three pillar projects. These are our three pillar projects, and um, they are the University Leadership Initiative, the University Student Research Challenge in the middle, and the Gate Raised Blue Skies. So most of our funding goes to support the University Leadership Initiative. These are one to two million dollar a year efforts, and we're really looking at university teams, universities to, to generate their own ideas how to solve NASA's problems within aviation team up with others and propose to this yearly submission. Um, you know, ultimately in university innovation, we're trying to develop the next generation workforce inside of aeronautics, but we're also trying to do really cool technical work and uh, we are and solve NASA's problems. So uh, the university university or the university student research challenge, which you see in the middle, this is for students with their own ideas. So they propose, they can get up to 80K. Um, we have three cycles per year. And this is sort of our, our uh, entrepreneurial incubator, if you will. So we require uh, teams to crowdfund uh, to help support their research efforts. And then lastly, over on the right is Gateways to Blue Skies. This is a student competition where students usually team with advisors, uh, typically a it ends up being a senior project for these students, but we provide them a system level challenge within aeronautics to tackle. Um, we're in our third year of that right now, and I'm gonna talk about some of, the, um, some of the ideas that some of the students came up with as a part of the second challenge we had, which was looking at uh, clean aviation fuels and energy sources. So this is something that we do yearly and it's run by uh, National Institute of Aeronautics, which is out at Langley. We, um, we provide opportunities to learn about what's happening in ULI and USRC and in the future also in Gateways Blue Sky through Tech Talks. You can see the uh, in the lower right, the, the web link to previous talks and also information and announcements on uh, upcoming talks. So this is really useful to get a feel for what's going on in aeronautics if you're interested. Let's move on to Brilliant Minds for Pure Blue Skies, this challenge. This is a new competition that we developed uh, this year in 2023. Uh, we're utilizing Hero X to crowdsource uh, through our NASA tournament lab um, to engage new solvers. So we, we've and at University Innovation of cast the net out to the United States and certain communities uh, inside of secondary education um, to look for ideas to solve NASA's challenges. Here we're, we're, we're looking to utilize um, Hero X and Shane's group to, 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 to um, find new communities, people outside of the typical uh, communities that we usually engage with to try to ultimately find fresh new ideas. 
and even worldwide, as you've seen. So in green there, you see we're really in this challenge seeking fresh new ideas for solving the climate issues associated with air transportation. And we're really looking for new ones that are plausible and demonstrable, okay? Um, and some of the stuff there remaining on the tried is, is listed on the competition website. So we're given some, uh, with the potential to give several prizes and you have till December 14th to uh, submit or you know, find a, a US partner and submit. So let's talk about why, <laughs> why we're posing this challenge to you. So currently, um, you know, the demand, as you could imagine, for air travel is going to increase. As more people, we have more people in the world and more people are affluent enough to fly, they're going to fly to see the world because that's one of the greatest things you can do in life is to travel and see other things and other communities and other locations. So there's quite a few aircraft currently. This is data is slightly outdated. Some is about 30,000 commercial aircraft out there. Um, you know, we're looking at billions of passengers, many billions of passengers utilizing air transportation and also continuous use of tr air transportation for freight. It's estimated by the mid 2030s that there'll be 200,000 flights worldwide per day. That's a lot of flights. We're seeing that the demand for air transport will increase by almost 20, almost 4% per year over the next 20 years. And you can see there a graph of uh, revenue, passenger kilometers um, versus time, uh, some historical data that's CAGR is compound annual growth rate. And, and you can see that it, indeed um, there is going to be an increase. In it. <laughs> uh, Shane, I noticed that the, the video shows up on my screen in blocks, so I'm going <laughs> to kind of move you out of the way. Okay, that's better. All right, so we can all agree there's going to be uh, an increase in, in, in air travel. Uh, air, that means that there's going to be more emissions. And as you may know that there is a contribution to uh, global warming as a result of these emissions that we're putting up in the sky. So this is most air transportation that were at least the ones that were considered in, in this challenge flights over two hours, utilize gas turbine engines to provide the propulsion. Air comes in the front of that engine, gets compressed, is mixed with a, a hydrocarbon fuel, jet A fuel in the combustor, plus uh, aromatics, which contain sulfur to, that do certain things in the engine I won't get into, and they're burned and spit through a turbine and out the back end. So you can see a number of compounds here, chemical compounds that come out the back end. It's not completely inclusive. There's also some oils at the engine and things uh, that come out, but the, the, the boxes in red are the ones that contribute to uh, global warming, and the ones in blue may uh, may actually cool the atmosphere, but in in the end, do we really? We would a, a goal to achieve would be to try to to get rid of any emissions that come out the back end. I mean, ultimately, if we could run fans with batteries, um, then we wouldn't have any emissions, and we could at least mitigate this problem, this challenge at hand. Um, may go into some of these more on the next few slides, but um, obviously carbon dioxide is a big contributor to global warming. Um, the aircraft, air transportation community does contribute four to five percent of that. Uh, there are numbers as high as eight that people predict. And, and if all other modes of transportation decarbonize, then that percentage of contribution to global warming due to air transportation will increase. Look at it in a, a slightly different way. This is the effect of radiative forcing that uh, aviation can have on the climate. So if you look at the bottom, you see the zero. Numbers to the right of zero are bad and numbers to the left are good. Uh, at the top, you see that contrails and carbon dioxide emissions are a huge contributor uh, to radiative positive radiative forcing. And you can see that there's huge error bars, those black bands, those are the error bars. So you see that contrails, there's quite 
quite a lot of uncertainty in what they do. Contrails usually form uh, based on particulate matter that comes out the back end like soot um, and under the right conditions forms ice crystals and then spreads and lasts maybe for a couple hours. And at night, the contrails are bad. They trap the heat in and during the day, they actually can be good. Uh, they're blocking sunlight from hitting the earth. So they can, so there's some variation there, but the cumulative effect is apparently, at least as far as we know now, bad. So there are other emissions there. You see in the middle, NOx. NOx could have, with the air bars, no effect or uh, a higher effect than, than shown there, a positive uh, of an increase in radiative forcing. And so this can this can be found online. It's in a paper by Lee, and it's publicly available. You could get an idea. But all you know, this kind of lays out which which emissions are 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 problematic and sort of gives a hierarchy. And in the challenge, you know, we one of the judging criteria is on is on which which of these harmful emissions are you addressing, and you might be scored on how many of these uh, that you address and how significantly you address those. Moving on, this is a graph, uh, a chart I gave at uh, ASME Turbo Expo this year uh, in a forum panel on sustainable turbo machinery. So this is the classic uh, environmental CO2. We're focused just on CO2 now, the wedge chart. And it gives some history of the, of the CO2 emissions back to 2000 and then shows the dip due to the pandemic. And then moving out as we uh, the increase in demand for air travel uh, occurs, um, that first part there, you see, if we did nothing, we didn't replace any aircraft, we didn't develop any new technology, you can, you can see how it's going to increase from a little over 200 uh, million tons of CO2 all the way up to 450 by the year 2050. Now, aircraft are being replaced by, say, 737 Maxes and others and Airbus, and there are new technologies that are reducing the fuel burn and reducing um, the amount of emissions. So that brings you down really to that blue line tra trajectory. So there's still an increase there in emissions due to demand, but we've reduced the impact. We are and currently. Then there's some new aircraft technologies. The, the engine manufacturers, GE uh, and Pratt & Whitney primarily and likely Rolls-Royce too are developing clever new ideas on how to reduce those carbon dioxide carbon dioxide emissions as well. That brings you down to the yellow, the top of the yellow section, the yellow wedge. Um, as you know, you sit on the tarmac and you and you move around uh, the airports with the gas turbines running very inefficiently. There are ways possibly with electric tugs or, or other means to reduce those emissions further on the ground. Okay, then we get to the SAFs, the sustainable aviation fuel. So this is our current idea on how to solve the carbon dioxide problem in the atmosphere is by is by creating or, or building building sustainable aviation fuels essentially from plants so we're going to take plants or carbon capture and artificially create the fuels so we're not going to take the carbon that's stored underground and fossil fuels out we're going to take that carbon that's already out there and recreate fuels and we're going to do that either at the, we could do that at the 50% level. You see where that takes us. That gives us a decrease from 2000. So that would be good. And then if we use entirely use, or we our, the fuel was entirely sustainable aviation fuel, it could take us all the way down to that net zero, zero at 2050, that second red dot on the way down. Well, okay, so we've got a plan. There's a lot of challenges to that. Um, if we do go to 100% SAF and you see that vertical line on the right, that first one, 17% of that reduction is due to the, the, the fact that we're not generating this Jet A fuel from crude oil anymore. And 83% then is from removal of CO2 from the atmosphere by plants. Well, that seems like a huge number, right? So, so that means that we must be using a huge amount of plants to create this new SAF fuel. And, and is that going to work? Well, you know, we don't know yet, but we're working on that. And I'm going to go over to a quote on the right side that I just I added to this chart today that I got from a paper on utilizing metals as a fuel for aviation. The carbon contained in 3 million liters of atmosphere must be extracted in order to produce one liter of hydrocarbon fuel. 
So vacuuming the entire atmosphere of carbon dioxide is a tall order. So there's a huge penalty and energy required to do that just to, to make a small amount of fuel. So that doesn't really seem like uh, that viable of an option, at least from the carbon capture perspective. So if you look at that first dot uh, up at the top of the, the solid green wedge, you see that in this scenario, we're still pumping 300 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Okay, so boy, that just seems like a challenge that somebody should be looking at. Can we get rid of that? Can we take these dots, these two dots, and move them, all, move that top dot all the way down to true zero, all the way at the bottom? So how could how could we do that? Well, if we use the fuel like hydrogen or ammonia that we didn't produce and emit any carbon dioxide then maybe we could get down to, to true zero or actually net negative, we would call it. So we'd actually be providing a benefit to the atmosphere with some other challenging alternative, let's say. Are there other techniques that could be utilized to get us down to that point, to that point in, in the area of combustion, chemical alterations, something we do up to, this, to the emissions coming out to the back end, something we do at the front end, is there a new fuel that we could use that improves things? A fuel that's generated, say, with the new tools that are out there, these deep learning and AI tools. So what are we doing inside of university, university innovation already to try to solve this challenge, this challenge that goes beyond just looking at SAFs? Well, this is a, this is a, a chart that shows our entire ULI portfolio and I'm gonna have you focus on the light blue area in what's, I hope you can see called thrust three. Thrust three is um, improving subsonic transport. That's kind of the area that this challenge is working in. And there is seven, there's seven uh, projects there that are being worked Four of Those are sort of related to this challenge in zero emissions aviation. So the first one is the Ohio State effort. And that was to look at electrified propulsion in a hybrid manner. So there'd be some batteries on board, but you'd also be burning some fuel. And you'd use motors to generate, to, to, to power, to rotate some of the propulsors. And you'd get some net benefit in fuel burn reduction. And they showed that you could get a benefit using uh, machines on the order of a megawatt on a regional jet in concert with gas turbine engines. And they developed this motor. Um, here that's integrated that I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, in this talk. The University of Illinois is working uh, in their CHEETA Center, uh, Center for High Efficiency Electrical Technologies for Aircraft, on a liquid hydrogen concept. So there's a whole bunch of technologies within the plane that you see there. I'll talk about some of those on a, on a subsequent slide. But um, what you see there is a modified tube and wing where there's no fuel in the wings. Um, there's groups of three propulsors. These are electric motors driven by superconducting motors. The liquid hydrogen is in tanks above the passenger and outside of the passenger compartments. So it's a cool, a cool design that's uh, still being worked in a phase two. Florida State's working on a similar um, idea with liquid hydrogen, but they're gonna use um, fuel cells and a, uh, and a turbo generator that runs on hydrogen. Um, I should say that in the Illinois project, they were looking at fuel cells only, a detail I left out. So this is a cool concept vehicle. Um, I'll show you the plan form and the guts of that shortly. The University of Central Florida has a project looking at ammonia, uh, a conventional tube and wing where they would carry ammonia as a liquid, as a hydrogen carrier. So there's, you know, NA, ammonia is NH3. So there's, there's hydrogen there that could be utilized in the combustor and there wouldn't be any carbon um, emissions. And finally, Tennessee Tech is looking at a, um, a solid oxide fuel cell combustor, which is pretty clever. Um, and that would also utilize ammonia. So no hydrocarbon or no C. Okay. Cheetah effort. So you can see this is we, we these uh, there's uh, teams. These um, ULIs are run by one university principal investigator, but they team with other universities and industry. You can see GE here and a number of industry or uh, academic uh, university logos. And these are all the technologies that are going into this 
into this uh, particular concept vehicle. Now, what I, what I want to say here is that liquid hydrogen is a, is a great approach, but it has to be super cold. It has to be, it'll be stored at roughly 20 Kelvin. That poses some challenges. There's uh, the liquid likes to turn into gas when it's sloshed around and and how do you utilize that vents, the, that gas and, and, and um, uh, not and just vent it and consider it lost. Ultimately here, you know, liquid hydrogen is four times the volume as jet A. So you've got to figure out a way to get that volume down. You want to reduce that volume down as far as you can to make this aircraft more feasible. So some of the ways to do that is to, one way to do that is, is to look at all the possible efficiency gains that you can get from the, from the aircraft side and the propulsive side. And that's what's being done here. They're looking at super superconducting power transfer, cryogenically cooled electronic components, uh, integrative propulsion aircraft, propulsion airframe integration, uh, and a number of other things. This is the plan form for that vehicle. Uh, you can see the, the racetracks. Those are the individual tanks. Um, power electronics, you see the motors, uh, M, the circles with the motors. And there's some uh, superconducting power transfer cables in there. So zero resistance. You can run these at 270 volts, which is great. Um, so yeah, that's what that looks like. For Florida State, here's the plan form. Uh, one of the unique features here is that they plan to carry liquid oxygen on board for the fuel cells. So normally at altitude, you have to intake air in and compress it to utilize in the, in the fuel cell. Uh, here, they're going to carry their own oxygen uh, as well. So this is, you know, I've talked a lot about some of the technologies here for Cheetah. Uh, this is how their plan form shakes out for their idea. For the University of Central Florida, um, not going to go through much of this, but I will say that they plan on carrying liquid ammonia on board. They will take that ammonia and they will they will crack it open via catalysis of some form. They're working on catalysis ca techniques to really get as much hydrogen out of the mixture as they can. So they ultimately would like to take the NH3 and, and convert it into exclusively N and H2. However, that the process doesn't work that well, so or not completely. So you still have some NH3 in the mix. So they're working on that, and ultimately you would take that that the hydrogen gas from cracking, burn that in the combustor, a con sort of conventional approach in a gas turbine. Um, there still be some NOx because there's compressed air from the atmosphere going in, but you can utilize the not the NH3, the ammonia, to mitigate some of that NOx. Um, not shown here also, they plan on taking some of the heat of combustion that comes out of the exhaust and the, of the turbine and utilizing that for some electricity generation and a supercritical CO2 cycle, which is listed here. So that's the University of Central Florida idea. So we're, we're looking at ammonia. So ammonia, NH3, right? No, no carbon in there to, to reduce these problems with the CO2. Finally, Tennessee Tech, this is a, a, a very streamlined idea of their approach. Um, basically, in essence, they're using the fuel cell to replace the combustor in a gas turbine. And, um, and at the same time, uh, generate electricity to be used in propulsion. So they get uh, a lot of heat coming out of that fuel cell. Uh, there's a combustor also in there somewhere, not shown and um, it, it boosts the efficiency of the gas turbine cycle from you know, 40, 50%, possibly up as high as 70%. So now you're using less fuel, less exhaust, less harmful emissions, no CO2, possibly still water there. So that's a problem because of the contrail problem I mentioned earlier. Okay, that was projects within our university leadership initiative pillar of our project. Now I'm going to talk about gateways to blue sky and clean aviation energy. So in 2023, we put out a challenge to these to students to come up with, uh, to take a look at energy sources for aircraft and fuels and do a life cycle analysis on those fuels and looking out to use in 2050. So we got a number of proposals. We, we filtered that down to eight teams. They 
formalize their papers for presentation, uh, papers for submission, eight teams, and then had a, a competition between these eight teams at the Glenn Research Center this year at the end of May. So there was the team shown here as a picture of um, of some of the students and the staff that that work that I'm in the back uh, right there. Um, in the the team that that won the competition looked at aluminum powder, and the second place team looked at directed energy beam propulsion. So I'm just going to show those briefly here. So this is the um, infographic that the team from Boston University produced for aluminum powder combustion. So um, in the upper left there, you see that they plan to burn aluminum powder of some specific particle size that's optimized in the gas turbine mixed with oxygen. Um, oxygen that they plan to carry on board, uh, much like you saw in the Florida State concept. So the idea here, like, let's, uh, well, let me carry on a little bit here. So, so this aluminum would be burned, and then there'd be an aluminum oxide uh, byproduct, right? So, and some gas due because of the air. So you would, you would, in this, in this idea, collect that aluminum oxide particle that, that was, that was a byproduct of the combustion here that generated propulsion, and then you would dump it at the end of a flight and then recycle that aluminum oxide back into the optimized particles for fuel. So you'd have this continuous life cycle of aluminum. And once you had enough aluminum in the system that you mined, say in a green way, potentially, um, then you wouldn't need any more fuel and it would just be this continuous uh, cycle of, of, uh, of fuel and combustion byproduct. So this slide gives some some details, I'm not gonna go into them here and on the time, but this stuff is all available uh, online. Uh, their paper likely is too at that website on the previous slide. So at the bottom, blueskies.naiNet.org. So you can look at other challenges and other teams and see what they propose. All with the idea though, of reducing harmful emissions uh, in flight. So this was a cool idea, and ultimately, uh, the concept that was, as it was looked at in the concept, the plane would actually get heavier. However, this team thought if they carried the oxygen and they predicted how much they would need and how much it was weigh, then the airplane shouldn't get heavier because um, because they use that that oxygen for the combustion along with the aluminum, and the byproduct should weigh the same. So, but the plane is still landing as heavy as it takes off. So that requires uh, some additional structure to be able to handle that landing, especially hard landing. So the plane's ultimately maybe gonna get heavier from a structural perspective. So there's a lot of details there to be hashed out, but a cool idea. Uh, our our uh, aeronautics administrator, Bob Pierce, uh, in talks I've seen used to joke about aircraft uh, running out of aluminum. He said, every plane would be a one use attributable plane. We'll just burn the aluminum structure for propulsion. So it's kind of a joke, but then he, he sits in on these gateways, the blue skies competition. And now you hear him talking a little bit about the potential of aluminum powder. So it's quite interesting, uh, uh, result of this competition. So this team did a nice job. Um, I'll show you this lastly, this is my last slide. Um, we had a couple teams look at energy beaming, so actually providing the energy from somewhere else. So the plane carries virtually no energy. Now, maybe it carries some batteries for certain portions of flight uh, or some other energy sources, especially in the case of emergency. But, but ultimately, this the idea was you'd have high-powered uh, pulsing beams that initially in their analysis or, or in their and their idea would start out in phase one as being directed from the ground. If you look at the bottom, you'd have these stations along the route, say, in this case, from LAX to, to Seattle, and they cover a predicted they could work over a 215 mile radius and they they take over once you were coming out of one energy beam zone, you'd be picked up by another ground station. But ultimately, then this power might be beamed to relay stations in space. And then ultimately the power would come from space. So, you know, you look at this and say, wow, is this feasible? Well, you know, at the onset, it doesn't sound very feasible. And in fact, uh, to do phase three and have power satellites, you're talking about uh, multiple launches per day and hundreds of thousands of satellites 
and you think, wow, this doesn't really seem feasible, but who knows, right? If, if, uh, if the, the, the temperature of the earth goes up by three degrees C in the next 10 years uh, against what we're thinking and hoping, um, then we might be looking to more higher risk uh, ideas and concepts to pursue if we in fact still uh, can stay cool enough to travel <laughs> worldwide. So I'm gonna close with that and hand it back to Shane to handle questions and answers. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can about the materials that I presented. Uh, thank you for listening. Awesome, thanks so much for that, Andy. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So for anyone who wants to follow up on the information or maybe check it out after the call, this will be recorded and posted to the challenge page in a couple of days. So uh, you can look back at some of those charts, take a look at the different kinds of emissions you mentioned we're targeting. Um, and then also just as a reminder, in this challenge, we're looking to go beyond and even think about what other areas of flight or the flight planning network or how we approach fuel can be addressed, um, since these are the areas that we're already working you know, are, that are being worked on presently. Um, with that, though, I'm going to transition us into the open Q and A section. It looks like some of you have already figured this out, but if you haven't, click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and through there you can submit some of your questions if you'd like us to, to approach them. Um, while you're doing that, though, I see that we've had another NASA member join us, Mina. Um, would you mind giving yourself a little introduction, Mina? Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning, all. Um, hopefully you can see my video. Let's see. Oh, it's not letting me enable the video. No I'm sorry about that. Um, so I work with Andy Provenza in the University Innovation Project, and I'm the Deputy Project Manager, and also the uh, University Leadership Initiative Technical POC. So um, I monitor and administer all of the ULI awards that uh, we give out to the university teams. Wonderful. Thanks for introducing yourself. Sure. Um, with that, I'll transition us into a few questions from the audience here. Um, these are open to anyone on the NASA panel to, to chime in and give their thoughts on. Um, but I'll start with a simple one from Med Popovich, who's a solver on past Herox challenges. He was wondering if wind and solar technologies have already been considered and explored, or if there's any uh, value in, in looking further into that. So. I'll try to answer that. So for 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 wind and solar, so solar has been looked at for aircraft. There's uh, the the solar conversion and the the, the um, surface area density on the plane isn't enough to for these types of flights to really provide enough power for propulsion. Now people have looked at certainly using solar and wind to do things like charge batteries that could go on a flight. But currently for the types of flights we're looking at in this challenge, batteries aren't an exclusive option because their energy density is roughly 60 times less than that of jet fuel. So they're just too heavy to buy themselves on the plane um, to provide all the propulsion. Now they can become part of a system. Maybe they provide energy uh, on, on takeoff or they're utilized at crews maybe, but um, that's that's one of the ways that to answer, one of the answers to your question is how it could be utilized. Now, let's say there's some break breakthroughs in battery energy density in the future. Um, if we could get to say, you know, 5,000 kilowatts per kilogram or 10,000, then maybe, and, and we can utilize elements and chemicals that are readily readily available, or or because um, we're going to need a lot of these, right? Um, then maybe this this problem ends up being solved. But but currently, we're not on that kind of path. We don't see us getting to that point anytime soon. So that's why we're looking at the things that I showed you. But we're also looking to you for other ideas. So there's lots of other ideas that I didn't show you that have been looked that have been running around in people's head. I, actually, I'm going to add one thing. I did. On the one slide, um, on the Boston University aluminum powder fuel, on the side, I had a note that I forgot to, to mention. 
and it talked about using silica as a metalloid as a metal power and that was in a paper that's out there that you can find on using metal powers and the joke to that was that well we looked to to saudi arabia or those those countries uh, arab countries to for, for crude oil right and we buy crude oil from them and we utilize that to to generate to 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 process into jet a well maybe in the future if we could use silica silica we would we would be importing sand from them since there's a lot of sand out there and we would turn the sand into fuel. So that was the joke. I I left that out. I was running. I used up way more time than I planned to. <laughs> I hope that that's but but um but solar uh, on planes themselves doesn't seem viable. Um, now wind, you know, maybe maybe there's some way to to utilize you know to think about taking energy. From flight, so your, your wind's flying over the wind's traveling over the aircraft. Can you utilize that wind to generate some energy on board that aircraft um, to enhance or to to supplement uh, the energy of flight? So that's interesting. Now you pay the price of drag somehow, maybe, but um, maybe that's something to be looked at. All right. Great, thanks, Andy. One small uh, follow-up question on the aluminum um, oxide technology you mentioned. We had a, an attendee ask whether or not there'd be any benefit to sort of like incremental benefits to tweaking that technology, like uh, maybe dropping the aluminum oxide before landing in some way so that you could reduce the landing weight. Um, so I guess, is there any space for providing improvements to those existing technologies? Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. Like if you could pack it up into boxes and then drop them on parachutes or something, or uh, at some airports, you know, there's a zone where you could uh, let it out and it could either be captured or or or, um, or acquired in some way to be reused. You know, those, those are interesting ideas. Those are my thoughts on it. I, We've we've had some discussions about that, and um, those are interesting, you know, ideas. And maybe you have your own ideas, and uh, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. One follow up question from that we've got a couple left here. Is let's see here. Can you tell us a little bit more about what future collaboration would look like through the university university partners program for a winner? Because um, at least. From the way the challenge is designed, my understanding is that um, even if you don't know how to bring your own idea to its full completion, you should still submit it because NASA wants to pair you up with people who can help explore the idea further. Um, is that the case, Andy? And do you want to add any meat to that to that subject? Sure. Um, I'll say that currently inside of University Innovation, we have enough. I showed three pillar portfolio items. We have a number of other items that we've started this year this is one of them but there was others that i didn't have time to mention and you know we we we've we're, we're utilizing our budget for workforce development and doing great cool technical work and in the future there could be the chance that especially if we see a great idea that's not being worked that we would carve out a small part of that budget in some way uh to continue work on this if we were to do that in university innovation, we would require that your your idea would be work with some team that works at a university, right? That's if it's not if it wouldn't be done at a university. Let's see, we've got another couple of other sister groups. Um, we've got the Transformative Tools and Technologies Project, which works on technologies. NASA folks work on those, and we also have con uh, Convergent Aeronautic Solutions or CAS. And it could be that we would take that idea and transition it to one of those two projects. And then it would maybe would be worked with their funding inside of NASA and not at an university. So if it, if it was gonna be worked at a university, it would probably go through us. Now, with that said, there there's no guarantee even that, that the, the winner of this challenge would get that opportunity, but we have had internal discussions about it. And if we do see something, um, we will, try to figure out if we can make that happen. Wonderful. 
thanks for that that insight. Um, honestly, that's so cool to me, at least speaking for someone who's seen other challenges that um, generally the, the onus is either put on just getting ideas out there or on asking the innovators themselves to provide a prototype. But in this challenge, having the opportunity to both um, just give something that's a bit outlandish, but still feasible and achievable and more efficient than what it exists, um, and then having the support to explore that with people who can offer their own perspective, that's pretty unique. And so uh, I'd love to see uh, some more people participate in this challenge so that we can see their ideas grow. Um, with that, we have, let's see, we've got, we've got a little bit of time left here. One more question from Ned. He asked if there would be any interest in hybrid technologies like uh, electrolysis or ionic wind propulsion. Now that, that sounds like Greek to me. So I don't know if that's something that makes sense to you, Andy, but um, if not, we can also move to another question. Well, I'll try to answer it. Um, in, in um, you know, in the fuel cell area, I mentioned one solid oxide fuel cell. The, 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 the power density of those is, is pretty low. You know, jet engines may be somewhere around 10 kilowatts per kilogram. Fuel cells are around two, two and you're, you're dealing with a similar amount of heat loss and heat generation. So fuel cells may be around 50%. You know, is there something uh, in fuel cell tech with anodes and cathodes that can be done uh, to improve that efficiency and reduce that heat, uh, that heat load, and possibly even in a lightweight manner, boost, you know, uh, reduce the weight and boost the efficiency. So the other one, ionic winds, um, I don't know much about that, but what I will say is, you know, if you have an idea where you would take advantage of polarities within the air somehow or the earth's magnetic field or the due to the nature of um something that happens on the aircraft interface with the air uh somehow extracting energy from the air during flight that can provide some energy for propulsion then propose it um you know provide provide some bit of analysis to show that it's feasible to produce X amount of energy and um, and talk about how your vision for, for how that might get demonstrated at some small scale initially and then up to some larger scale. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. All right, I'll close this out here with one. One final question. I'll, I'll give people a, a second to submit any other ones they have, but if not, I have one here from earlier, which asks, let's see, it asks, how much information does a solver have to provide um, to sort of elaborate on the feasibility of their idea? Their, their concern was, if it's really outlandish, how can they really know how feasible it is? <laughs> Yeah, that I mean, that's the ultimate challenge here for you. If it's that crazy, I I guess um, if it's an idea that involves any bit of technology that's already been worked, you could point to, you could extract information from papers that are out there. I would encourage you to do that for us because um, we there's a finite amount of reviewers. And if we're required to go digging through journals and papers, we, we may not do that. It's gonna be kind of, we're gonna rely on what's in the in your narrative. Um, you know, if it's physics-based or chemistry-based, there's equations out there that you can draw to. And hopefully um, either you or someone that you know can do some kind of, at least back of the envelope, analysis or calculations to show some level of potential for the idea. Um, you know, we're, there's a number of us that'll be looking at these. We're all subject matter experts in different areas of aeronautics. Some of us have some space experience, um, but if we can't understand the, the, the realistic, um, potential of the idea, then it, it probably won't 
probably won't win. Awesome. From your experience, do you have anything to add, Shane, to that? I, no, I think you actually, challenges? yeah, I think you did a really good job of pointing out how if a great place to look is so maybe your solution is actually taking advantage of eight existing technologies, but you're putting them together in a way that no one has thought of before. Yeah. Like you said, pointing to those existing technologies and saying they've done it here, it works there. That's a great way to start. Otherwise, um, if you can even do just some preliminary um, calculations or math, or maybe even just some other, like you said, sort of like back of a, a napkin um, investigations into how your, your solution could be feasible. Um, maybe say, hey, it's used in this area that's not related to aviation, but they use it there. Um, that's another way you can you can do so as well. Um, don't want to solve the problem for people, but you had given examples of, say, you know, we were going to redesign planes to fly fly through rings that help propulse planes onwards. And they went through ring after ring after ring. And I realized after that, that discussion that, oh, you know, there was a Harry Potter toy that did the same thing way back oh, in really? 2002. And you would move a ball through floating rings. And so that was kind of funny, but now that wouldn't be like a perfect example, but I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Oh, I just wanted to add to the folks on on the call that that was uh, that idea I just posed to the the group that helped um, put this challenge together. So uh, Shane and Kevin and some other folks. I just, you know, look, I I think about this this challenge uh, all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night. I write down ideas. <laughs> so uh, um, so a lot of things come to mind, and, and one of those was you know sort of on this theme of directed energy, not just focus right on the aircraft, on the skin of it, or right on the combustor or something to heat up, say, water and have a closed steam cycle that would run the turbine to, to run the fan to provide the propulsive force, but actually these uh, a tube of energy or something between two satellites and and uh, <laughs> or the ring approach that he just mentioned. So, you know, far out stuff. We, we, we uh, you know, this is an exciting uh, space to be in, an exciting time in aviation. And uh, it was exciting to put this challenge out there and we're hoping to, you know, we're hoping to find something real, but it's going to be, it's going to be fun to, to see what everybody proposes as well. Absolutely. Um, I've actually got one really great question here that I'll try to squeeze in, but we'll be quick so I can give people the final thoughts. Uh, Simon Wilson asks um, how, or he points out that solutions generally fall into avoiding, minimizing, uh, mi mitigating, and then offsetting emissions. And he asks if there's any priority that NASA prefers in that. Um, give some other examples saying that um, he wondered if just finding new sources for biomass for SAFs would be an eligible solution. Yeah, um, I would say that my intention for this for this challenge was to not look for offsetting. Like I, I showed the wedge chart and I showed that first dot at the top there with that 300 megatons of CO2 predicted being put into the atmosphere. Um, and if, if we do that, we're also putting all the same almost you can make a case maybe not but but almost all the same emissions that i listed on that gas turbine figure into the atmosphere which had all those effects i showed on that radiative forcing chart so um based on the, the judging criteria that we establish um that would be just focusing on co2 and it really wouldn't be focusing on uh in-flight emissions it's sort of a balanced thing and look that might be the way we end up going um but this challenge was more looking for different ideas than that so then that would help or um rank the three areas that you astutely uh put these the categories that you put the ideas in so you know, ultimately we're looking for preventing them before they get out there. Um, however, I've seen some really great ideas to do something with them. Uh, as as I mentioned, doing something at the beginning of the cycle and the combustor at the end of the cycle. And I don't want to give too much away from, from any ideas that are out there that we've seen 
but um, there might be something to do in the in the uh, the mitigation portion. So I guess that would be the second one. Yeah, prevent maybe it would be first, mitigate second, and then offset third. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for that, Andy. Well, we've only got five minutes left here, so I'll be really quick on showing you how to participate in this challenge. You would come to herowix.com slash pureblueskies. I'm sure you've seen this link already if you signed up for this webinar. And then you come down to this solve this challenge button when you're ready to participate. The summary tab here has all the information on the challenge, including some eligibility stuff. Uh, the forum is where you can ask us questions and we'll be able to respond to you there. So I encourage you to use that. And then if you click on solve this challenge, it'll, it'll show you the rules and terms that you would have to agree with. This is also has that eligibility information in it. I'm gonna click accept to show you what it looks like. And then you can choose whether to uh, participate with a team or compete individually. And so you can change this later, but let's just say, yes, I want to join a team. You can change your status here to say uh, looking for a team or you don't have to put that as publicly indicated. I can also say, if I come back to the main page here, if I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, you can always click join a team here later on and you're able to both invite people um, or add yourself to other people's teams who are looking for members. Um, in some of these, they describe what kind of talent they're looking for and what their team is like. So you can join that way. You can also create your own team and list similar requirements. So once you do that, you go to begin entry here. This is the submission form page. It'll tell you exactly how you need to respond to all these eligibility questions. And then eventually your, your own submission responses here. Uh, we do want you guys to be thorough, but there is a character limit It'll tell you when you're getting too far or to too long in, in your responses. Um, these can use embedded images and videos and links. So feel free to use that as well. Once you're done, you'll hit save and preview and then submit. So I just wanted to share that really quickly, but um, let me get this screen share stopped here. As a closing thought, I will send out a poll here to ask you your guys' thoughts on where you think most value lies in future and mission elimination solutions. Um, and with that, Mina, I wanted to thank you for joining us. Did, did you have any final thoughts for the audience here or um, will we just wrap it up? Uh, no, I'm just excited to see all the uh, great ideas that you're gonna be uh, getting from uh, participants. Looking forward. Lovely, thank you. And how about you, Andy? Any final thoughts for the audience? I was reading your poll question there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'd just like to say, you know, thanks for attending and, and spending uh, almost an entire hour with us on this. Um, you know, I tried to put together s slides from various places to put together a story on, you know, what's being looked at. And um, maybe that triggers some, some ideas in your brains on uh, alternative approaches to to really solve this challenge, you know, it's a this is a big deal. We're in NASA. We're really looking to um, 2050 and be, beyond with um, new aircraft designs and, and new energy sources and propulsion concepts. And in fact, I, I will add that if you're interested in looking, we we do put out a, a, a formal solicitation in aeronautics. And if you search for NASA Aeronautics or ARMD and ROA, Research Opportunities in Aeronautics 2023, you'll find that solicitation. And what that'll show you is some of the things that we're looking for from outside, from industry, from academia to solve these challenges that we foresee in the future in aeronautics. And one of those is called ACES, A-C-E-S, I think, 25th, 2040. So um, some of this stuff that we've talked about today, um, will find its way in, into the into the proposals that people put forth to NASA to work uh, in this space. So thanks again. And Shane, thanks for hosting this. And, and um, yeah, good luck putting together uh, a sol solution. Thanks, Andy. Um, with that, I want to thank the audience for joining us. And then I think John actually gave us the best closing thought, which was he thinks you look a little bit like Kurt Russell. And so... <laughs> Not sure if you'd agree, but let the audience decide here. <laughs> I would say I that that's a new so one. I've 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 been told uh, 
that I look like a lot, a lot of different people, but boy, I, yeah, I do look a little like them with the beard. John Stamos, <laughs> I got recently. Uh, there was a picture of me where I looked a lot like him, and I had to agree in that picture I did. But <laughs> anyway, was, uh, thanks. thanks, lucky guy. That. If you get that, oh, if you get that many comparisons, that's fun. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody, and yeah, the recording to be posted in a couple of days. Just keep an eye out. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Nina. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.